Welcome to this episode of Pen to Paper Press Podcast. I'm Cindy Coaches. There is a backstory weaved into each book to explore the creative process. I'm sitting down with authors, writers, editors, publishers, and an array of creative souls to have a conversation centered on how they develop their stories to completing their works of art. Each episode is an opportunity for us to explore mindsets, pearls of wisdom, and the experiences that began our journey as an author from the moment we put pen to paper. After retiring from 37 years of finance, Sue Tressler purchased a small, narrow boat and wanted to decorate it with roses. This is where her art journey began. To encourage people with no prior skill to start painting. Sue wrote, time to start your art, learn to paint with passion. Welcome Sue, it is so good to have you here. Thank you ever so much, that was a really good introduction. (laughs) I'm I'm (laughs) really pleased to be here, it's great fun because the reason that I wrote my book was to share as much as possible with people Mm -hmm. the fact that they themselves can paint. And a lot of people just think, oh, no, it's too difficult for me. I don't understand it. I was no good at art in school. And they're missing out on so much. So that's why I wrote my book. It is very freeing to just paint, you know, or or whatever the art is. You know, it could be doing stained glass. It could be anything. Um, Just that to get that voice out, that internal voice. And I'm right there with you with the painting. I learned uh, watercolor uh, this fall as a way to just kind of get into a meditative state without going into a meditation. And it's amazing when you're creating art, how we lose not only track of time, but that sense of okay, I got to pay this bill, I got to do that. Oh, my God, I got this appointment. You know, how do I do this? Oh, I got this stressor, I got that stressor, or, you know, or or on the flip side, you're not thinking about all the exciting things that are coming up. When you're in that, that creative zone, you're, it is a form of meditation, because you're not, you're not thinking you're not dwelling. It's, it's just purely you and the medium. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're so right there. And that that was what got me really hooked, because when we bought our narrow boat, it was on a canal and it was covered in dolphins. And you don't get dolphins on canals. So we decided (laughs) we wanted to go back to the traditional canal art and we couldn't find anybody that could paint the roses for us. And we could have got some vinyl stickers, but that really just didn't gel with me because that's not being traditional. So I decided I'd have a go at painting with no previous knowledge whatsoever. And while I was busy attempting to learn to paint roses, my husband got all of the boat totally sanded down, done with pre-coat and then finally painted. So the last thing that was left was the doors on the front and back, which we took off and put some plywood there just temporarily, Mm -hmm. brought them home. And then it was my time to showcase my roses, which I'd been practicing. And I was really, really excited when I put these roses in a beautiful arch over both of the, the little doors that open at the front. And I decided to put them on the inside. So when the doors were open, you also had the arch of roses. And after that, I didn't have anywhere else I could put them. So I started to paint watering cans and milk churns and flower (laughs) pots and almost anything that I could lay my hands on. Um, But apart from anything else, the house got totally cluttered up with tin cans and artwork. (laughs) And um, (laughs) I I just wanted to keep painting. (laughs) So again, by chance, we were at a National Trust property and we were looking around it and it had a beautiful display of botanical art. And next to the art, it said, beginners classes sign up here. And I thought, wow, let's do a taster for this. And botanical art is so beautifully detailed Mm -hmm. compared to canal roses which are completely loose and very swift and flowing, uh, it was a hugely different technique to learn. So 
I started very tentatively, but I got on quite well with it and really enjoyed it. And then I thought it might be time now to actually invest in a, a few classes on how to draw because I didn't really know how to sketch or where shadow came in, um, how to get things looking 3D with shading. Mm -hmm. And I enrolled in a 10 week course. And my husband was sort of saying, well, you're doing an awful lot of artwork here. Um, when are we gonna get time to go out? And I said, <laughs> well, hang on a minute, because if we do art on a, if we, do art on a, a Wednesday from seven till nine. And then we go to the, the local pub. They've got this open mic sort of um, jazz band thing going on. So I said, you come to art with me and then I'll come to the jazz band with you. So my husband came along for 10 weeks <laughs> and, <laughs> and learned art with me, learned how to draw things. And in my book, what I decided to do was to actually put my very first drawing of a jam jar, which I erased so many times, I nearly sort of rubbed a hole in the paper because I just <laughs> really were, was just hopeless at doing it. But I listened to the teacher and I'm very much a learn by doing person. Mm -hmm. So I kept going, I practiced, I could see where things were good. And I felt kept, kept the bits that are good and then just alter the bits that aren't so good. And gradually you work your way through so that it's all looking quite good. Mm -hmm. And throughout the book, I'm showing various wobbly pictures where I seem to have got a finger that looks a bit like ET when I drew my <laughs> hand. And the index <laughs> finger, if you look very closely, seems to have grown an extra knuckle somewhere. Oops. And I thought, how did that happen? <laughs> but that's what happens when you're actually starting to do your art but it doesn't matter because you can see and you can always improve so when, when I got to the end of the chapter that I've done in my book on sketching I've ended up sketching one of the beautiful um, properties that we have in my hometown in Cardiff called Insel Court and it's an Edwardian building and it's got the most beautiful windows and almost every set of windows is different with a different arch, a different point, a different shape. And it was fascinating to draw because I trained my eyes to look really deeply um, at, at the sort of, sort of structure of the building mm -hmm. and translate that into the drawing. And I thought, I, this is really exciting. And being me then, I thought, what else can I do? <laughs> 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 and <clears throat> I started then um, looking at watercolours and um, as well as painting my canal art on some things now and then um, I was then sketching and I was starting to do watercolours and I went away for a weekend with my daughter for a watercolour um, event and we had a marvellous time it, it was absolutely great fun and I've written about that in the book. And I had two sketches. All of the other work is my own in the book. But there's two pictures my daughter did because they're wobbly ones. She, did, <laughs> she actually painted a rabbit and it looks as if it's got a big bulge on one side of its face. And I said, actually, if you think <laughs> about it, it might have just sneaked a carrot somewhere <gasps> and the farmer's come along and it's yes. got it in its cheek. <laughs> There you go. Oh, I loved it. And having the story behind the painting or well, the drawing. I love it. So, oh, I was going to ask you real quick, because, you know, where I'm from, uh, a narrow boat is not uh, something that I'm familiar with. Do you mind telling me what it looks like? Or, you know, obviously, it goes in a canal, because you've brought that up a couple of times. Yeah. And so what is a narrow boat? And the, a narrow boat is basically a very old fashioned traditional boat made out of steel, that's incredibly heavy. Okay. A lot of them have completely flat bottoms. And some of them have a slightly V shaped bottom. And years ago, during the Industrial Revolution, they were mainly used for transporting things like coal. And they were also used for transporting um, China and various um, sort of manufactured goods as okay. the Industrial Revolution came in. And 
then obviously when that got taken over by the railways and, and things, the canals in Britain just kind of started to go downhill. And eventually people thought this is a great resource, beautiful outdoors countryside that mm -hmm. we're missing. Mm -hmm. And people started to actually sort of um, restore the canals and start using these boats for actually having holidays and days out on. And okay. uh, that's what they are. But the one we had is a very, very small one. A lot of them are possibly three times longer than ours was. <laughs> oh, wow. Interesting. Because, I mean, you know, when when I saw um, the words narrow boat, you know, like on your website. And by the way, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, so I, you know, I got your podcast application and, you know, I saw that it was your book is on art. And then I went to your website and the moment I saw that dandelion on your website, I'm like, she's in, <laughs> I didn't care what you had written on your <laughs> application. I'm like, if she can do that dandelion. I want to talk to her. <laughs> tell you what earlier on when we were when we were just chatting a little bit beforehand you know I mm -hmm. said I designed cushions for my caravan mm -hmm. well the dandelion is actually the cushion cover from in my caravan I've got oh, cushions nice. made out of that <laughs> I just love that dandelion and then um yeah I it, truly it was like thinking she could have written garbly goo on that application <laughs> and it would have been yep I don't care <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk to you because, you know, art is just, it's, it's so near and dear to me because yeah. generically put, it's the one thing that keeps me going. Yeah. It's the, that being creative, I don't, to have a mindless job would be, it would be torture for me. Mm -hmm because I've got that hyperactive imagination. I've got that, that need to, to create something. And, and maybe that's why I have used the outlet of writing to, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, I had that all together. <laughs> I had 37 years, believe it or not, of setting budgets, analyzing data, doing all sorts of um, office type roles mm -hmm. and, the very the last three years of my my role was quite different. I got involved with a lot of transformation in the, the company that I was working with. And that somehow led me to actually going to um, Turkey um, to look around a car factory, a manufacturing. And I was just fascinated how they could spray paint cars without getting dust in the paint. And, and I just love the oh, detail yes. of looking at things because how do you how do you get such a fabulous finish on cars? Not one tiny bit of dust. You try painting your, your doors at home or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! A bit a great point. So I've always been very much for attention to detail and, and getting into things, and I think that transfer from the financial side when I moved um, into the artistic side, when I retired, it opened up a whole new dimension. It's the same yes. attention for detail, but it's transferring it into being creative and, and doing artistic things. And that's, again, why I wrote my book. I want other people to be able to feel that, that passion and enjoy themselves. <laughs> yes, yes. So then what was it that Okay, so when did you actually start with the watercolor painting and, and all of that? Um, watercolor painting I started about three years ago. Okay. Um, that was that was again when I'd seen something advertised for the weekend with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, gradually once I'd got into the watercolors, I saw some absolutely beautiful flowers on Instagram um, that were by a lady called Jess Priest. Okay. And I started to follow Jess and I thought she's doing some beautiful work here. And she actually advertised a one day course for these beautiful flowers. And I thought, whatever it costs, I'm going. And it mm -hmm. was probably about 120 miles from my home. So I booked up and I drove over on a beautiful sunny day to this um, old building that had been made into a sort of artistic retreat. And I was with seven other ladies on the course. 
And we all sat down and we were, we were sort of chatting to each other when we arrived. And then she said, oh, OK, we'll just go around the table now and introduce ourselves. And all the other ladies around the table were actually professional artists of some description or another. And they're saying, oh, yes, I design all the different patterns for sports leggings. And I've got my own Gothic art studio, but I'd love to do flowers. And it came to me and I sort of said, um, well, I've retired. Um, I've started painting and I really want to do some beautiful flowers, please. I'm sort of going around the table with all these expert people. I'm starting to think, where were the paints? Because it said all of the equipment was going to be provided. Mm-hmm. And then I noticed these funny little sticks about the size of a pencil with bits of sponge on the end. And I thought, well, I've never used one of those before. And it suddenly dawned on me as we got to the last person, she actually said, I've really wanted to work with inks. And I'd signed up to a floral class, but it was floral ink and not watercolour. And I didn't even know ink existed because I was so naive at those times. (laughs) (laughs) So here I am expecting to be in with a load of novice people on a watercolour floral day. And I ended up with a lot of experts in art doing a really, really nice artistic ink day and learning totally different techniques. (laughs) But I had fabulous fun. There is no mistakes. You were meant to be there and just to gain the the techniques from one medium, you can apply those to other mediums. Yeah. That is so wonderful. What an experience. I actually I actually had to I didn't want to totally embarrass myself. So I actually got a tissue out of my handbag and sort of fiddled around a bit. Um, while I was watching the other ladies to see what they actually did with these sponge sticks to start painting (laughs) because I didn't want to look as if I'd never picked one up before oh (laughs) no (laughs) although I guess I'd be right there with you going um yeah okay and you know peering around the room and (laughs) being the observer (laughs) for a few minutes I know but by the end of the day it was fabulous and I actually found out then um, that two of the ladies that were on the course were actually on holiday in Britain from America and the lady Jess Priest before we had all this um, Covid problem Mm -hmm. uh, used to fly over to New York and she used to actually run the same classes in New York And these ladies had somehow missed it over there due to timings of things. Mm -hmm. So whilst they were on holiday in Britain, they thought, oh, we'll pick up a class with Jess. And had I realised she was that well known, I would have been, oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's a little bit of that intimidation factor there. (laughs) Yeah, but she's absolutely lovely lady. And um, along the one thing I did with my book I've got five different styles of art in the book, including the canal art, the sketching, watercolours, etc. And I've actually been in touch with the people that helped to teach me those things and told them I was going to write the story and mm. asked if they would like to read through the chapters to see they were happy. So all of the work that's in the book has actually been read by the artists who've actually taught me which is, you know, really nice because they've yes. wished me luck, good luck. And also, um, from a slightly more technical point of view, it avoids any issues of copyright or, or any problems of them saying, oh, you, you've mentioned me and I, I didn't really want to be in your book. Right, you know? right, right. Yes, it gives, uh, well, it verifies, one, it verifies the information as well. That yeah. what you what you perceive to be, the act of doing that particular medium is correct in in their world, you know, that they they are predominant in. And it's a good representation of them as well, because anybody who gets mentioned in the book 
you know, especially if it's in a memoir, <laughs> <laughs> wants to know, am I the good guy, the bad guy, or am I just someone sitting in the back going, <laughs> hi? <laughs> so well, what, what, I, oh go ahead go ahead go ahead now I was going to say strangely enough the the lady that had actually taught us on the watercolor weekend um came back and said I'd been extremely complimentary about her teaching and I'd actually taken in a lot of what she'd said and she said I've often wondered whether my pupils smile at me while I'm talking and then turn away afterwards and say what on earth was she on about then <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a relief to to realize that you know you took it in and you enjoyed it and the only thing that she corrected me on was the actual little village that the course was run was somewhere called maple durham and okay. i'd written maple durham as two separate words and she said oh by the way maple durham is just one word and that was her only comment all the rest of the, the um information that I put in about artistic style and the way that the course was run etc you know she was quite happy with so that was great for me really <laughs> that is brilliant I love that you went back to them and said can you read this so what was it that actually you know because it, when we start out on these different journeys and so forth we don't always realize that we're gonna you know write a book about it so no. <laughs> at what point did you you know what part of you said you know I need to share this and I'm gonna write a book um back in May of last year okay. a friend of mine who is an artist um who I've met through my art journey actually asked if I would give a talk about my art journey to her art group on on zoom because we were in lockdown and i was kind of thinking oh she's getting a bit desperate now scraping the bottom of the barrel asking me <laughs> and she said no people will be interested in your story yes, yes. I, said, but I haven't gone to art school and i've only had sort of maybe a handful of lessons with teachers on each of my topics no problem she said so i when I got the Zoom sorted out and I did this talk for about an hour and it was really funny because I had lots of different pictures on my screen and a tiny little picture of me in the top corner talking mm -hmm. back to myself. I couldn't see all of the audience and I'm kind of thinking, have they gone out to um, feed the cat or are they making a cup of coffee or have they just walked out the room, you know, and it was really strange because I'm just talking to nothing, <laughs> but I kept it going. Is, and, it is um, different, yes. At, at the end, they they were all really, you know, very nice, had some lovely comments and interesting questions. And um, somebody said to me, my gosh, you should write a book. And I said, oh, crumbs, I haven't got a clue about writing. And she said, but you didn't have a clue about painting either, did you? Oh, nice so, comeback. <laughs> no, no, she meant it in, in the way that, um, you know, I didn't have a clue yes. about painting, but I'd ended yes. up doing the presentation, you know. Wonderful. So she, yeah. Brilliant. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Why not? Yes. So that kind of lodged somewhere. And um, a bit later on, I think it was around about the beginning of June, I happened to be browsing through Instagram. And I saw an advert for a pop up group for a week to give you an introduction into writing your own book um, run by Michael Heppel. And because I was getting a bit bored in lockdown, I thought, well, I might have a look at this. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled for the week and it was only uh, perhaps an hour a day doing something. But I kind of got interested and, and I thought maybe I could write this book because People seem to be keen on what I'd said. And mm -hmm. it struck me that there are so many people like myself that actually could probably be super creative and enjoying themselves without having to learn all the detail because they're just doing it for fun and for enjoyment. Yes. But they never start because they're too nervous. So the idea grew. And then after the pop-up group, which was obviously 
the sort of hook and the advertising really. Um, there was a three month course on writing a book with various uh, different introductions on, on how to look for your sort of target audience and how to market your book, how to write it, etc. And I decided to sign up. So that started in July. And by the end of September, I had actually written my book because I knew what I wanted to talk about. So that bit was easy. And I decided not to put too much in because I think if you put maybe sort of eight, nine, ten topics of art, it gets a bit unwieldy. Mm -hmm. And I narrowed it down to the ones that I was most familiar with that um, I had good stories to link into because I wanted the book to be a, a sort of biography in a way, <laughs> but not specifically a biography of me, but a biography of the art evolving. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted it to be interesting to people that don't know anything about art. So there's not a lot of technical words in there, but enough there to sort of I suppose whet their appetite and get them to think yes maybe I could have a go at this so yeah, that. that was the that was the idea behind the book and um, when I spoke to Michael first he said well so exactly what is it it's not an art manual it's not an instruction book it's not your life story um you know where does it sit and I said well I know where it sits in my head but <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I can't really really explain but I, I was quite confident in what I wanted to get over to people and uh, I decided let's go for it and wonderful once I've got my teeth into something all my project management came in if you saw our spare room I had I had all sorts of post-it notes all over the wall mapping out the sort of progress of this book I had spreadsheets set up because this is me, which told me when I'd written so many words, how many pages that equated to, how many more pages I needed to do for that chapter. And it all changed colour when I'd edited. If I'd done two edits and a proofread, everything went green all the way across that line on that particular chapter on the spreadsheet. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's how my mind works. I'm a spread, yeah, spreadsheet junkie. Oh, I couldn't have survived without my spreadsheet. So but the, the end result was that when, when the book was um, written, I suddenly thought, now, how do I get it from my laptop on A3 paper into a book? Mm -hmm. And that was where I had so much to learn because I, I managed to get hold of a, a very nice publisher, um, not that many miles away from me but over in England in Gloucester and a beautiful gentleman in the choir press talked me through the whole process of making sure that I had all my mirror margins right that I'd um, got the font size correct that I'd actually brought the book size down to I think it's called Royal or Royale okay. and um, he, he was very very helpful but I did all these things practically manually on my laptop because I do believe that there are some publishing programs where you you really hardly need to lift a finger and, it, and you just tell it what you want it to do yes. um I didn't do it that way <laughs> I did it the hard way <laughs> that's me too boy we have so much in common <laughs> we have so and, much in common <laughs> add to that then because I wanted to put in a lot of my wobbly pictures and then have wonderful pictures at the end of each chapter so people could go from wobbly to wonderful and, and actually see it happening. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> some of the pictures were actually taken just on my phone maybe about three or four years ago. So the actual quality of the picture wasn't very good. So mm -hmm. I also had to learn how to improve the, um, the dots per inch or however it is they measure the quality of photographs. Mm -hmm. That's and, per inch quite a lot of problem there really but I, I got there in the end because I think there's about 84 um sketches drawings pictures illustrations throughout the book 
Mm-hmm. And when I reduce the size of the um, pages with the pictures in, obviously all the words and the pictures all moved on the pages. Oh, yes. Yes. So the next problem I had was I was told that because it's got pictures and some pages don't have any writing, I needed to make sure that every page finished at the end of a sentence. So no sentence carried on over to the next page. Mm-hmm. And that took a long time to sort out because every time I mm-hmm. altered the size of a photograph or picture, it pushed the words down the page and if I was on page 56, all the pages right the way to the back end of the book, all sort of um, wrapped around and, and moved. So that wasn't the best of times, to be honest. But I'm so determined once I get my teeth into something, it, I've got to do it. <laughs> you know, it's just the challenges there. <laughs> well, and formatting is, and, and that is one of the issues with formatting. And what, you know, you mentioned earlier about, the um, programs that many use for doing the um, for writing the book and what happens is if they transfer it to another program for the actual uploading into the um, depending on who's publishing the book you know your your outlet your chosen outlet to use the formatting issues And, you know, you have to go page by page by page by page to verify where everything sits. And and if you've got a formatting issue, the other thing that happens is sometimes, you know, your indents for the first paragraph, if you choose to do indents, you got to make sure they all line up. And, you know, inconsistency and see my mind um, sees the inconsistencies yep. and, and it's just like, I, you know, it's like that, that bump to the forehead, like, oh, no, no, no. Why, why didn't you see that? You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sue. No, I was going to say it, it's exactly like that because I've, I've actually done most of that work with my husband a few friends did look through things for me but my husband and I sat down what seemed to be for an eternity (laughs) and every so often he'd say to me you're not gonna like this but you've got a (laughs) bit of word wrap going here and I'm like oh no (laughs) yes oh but hey at least he was honest enough and said by the way Sue there's this issue right here because if he was if if he didn't care for the the outcome of the book he could have just let that slide underneath the table and you would never have known until it got printed or until you looked at the manuscript before printing and then it's like oh I've got this issue so at least he was courageous enough to say oh you're not gonna like this (laughs) (laughs) well when, when I when I was working in my last three years of my role um I I was working partly with some audit teams and that was a very, very sort of critical time because audits are being critiquing things basically. Mm -hmm. And I I really loved being critiqued because that gives you the opportunity to improve. And that opportunity, you know, you might not see it yourself, but if, if criticism is given in a constructive way, I think it can be extremely useful. So yes. the more people that could come up and say, oh, hang on a minute, you, you've sort of spelt that incorrectly or you, you've you got two sentences beginning with I went or something. Yes. <laughs> because yes. I was I was really picky on that as well. And it's, it's probably sounding now as if my book should be absolutely amazing. And to be quite honest, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there aren't quite a few little glitches here and there because, you know, you're striving for perfection, but I'm not sure you're ever likely to reach it especially well, not on your first book well and the <laughs> other thing is, well and, per, and perfection is perception yeah and it's whose perception you know somebody can look at it and say oh my god this is perfect and then the next person who doesn't follow the same punctuation setup that you do or you know the system 
or if they word things a little differently are going to look at it and they're like, oh my goodness sakes, why did she put a comma there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's all perception. Perfection is perception. And and, but it is, well, well, funny enough, I'm, I'm actually going to read a very small little bit out of my book now because it says, paint to please yourself and your passion and skills will grow. It's not about perfection. Your creativity is the key to enjoying your art. And I think that that sums it up, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it does. It does. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, that's what I want people to gain from my book is the fact that they don't have to be perfect with their painting. And actually, if you think about it in musical terms, you've got a lot of people that absolutely love rock music and really don't like classical music and you've got a lot of people that love classical music and maybe don't like hip-hop but it doesn't make any style of music bad music all music is good it's just appreciated in different ways exactly and I've tried to make that comparison with a painting so that whatever people create it it's just their their own creativity isn't it yes so do you have your uh cushions in that you know, your artwork for sale somewhere? Now, what what I did, you see, and it's in the book, um, I haven't got a whole heap of money because I'm retired and I'm not going to buy hundreds of cushions when I haven't got anybody to buy them or purchase them from me, really. So there's there's a company in <clears throat> in Britain um, called Rapturous that run competitions each year about three or four times. And you send your artwork in And from all the hundreds and thousands of people that send artwork in, they select people to actually join their company for divine designing products. But for people like me, it's really useful because when your artwork goes in, they actually convert it into a a sort of canvas picture, um, a cushion or an an actual just like an ordinary print. And people can buy those out of their shop for Mm -hmm. a certain period of time so I've actually submitted my own art and then ended up buying my own products (laughs) so I've got my own cushions (laughs) but it hasn't cost me anything other than just the cost of purchasing the item and I haven't got the problem of of sort of having to have all the setup and the agreements with the company and having Mm -hmm. to buy a certain number so if you ever want just cushions or or any bits of artwork done there's lots of ways if you look at just having one or two things done at at no great cost and I went over the top and I actually put my owl in as well so here's Mr owl in a cushion oh so we have the owl that is on the book (laughs) so he's moved from the book onto the cushion (laughs) that is beautiful I love the owl eyes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so then with promoting the book, did you find that to be one of those fun tasks in the process? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> promoting the book has been up and down all over the place. Um, because of my my planning ahead, I knew that the Rapturous Company were going to be having a competition leading up into the autumn which timed Mm -hmm. with my book so I deliberately had Mr had Mr Owl put on his cushion then because I thought that's that's a great sort of visual advert Mm -hmm. for the book to be able to put that online to show people that you've got cushions and some people who've bought the book have actually bought the cushions as well and um, I also put uh, the dandelion that you like into an, an art magazine I did have to pay for that it wasn't a great deal you you paid to enter your art into the magazine and depending on if they liked it or not you've got a small picture I was very fortunate that I did get a whole page spread in um, the artist talk magazine so my dandelion is in there so when I came to market the book I could go to people and say this is my book but actually my credibility as an artist is 
within this magazine and on this cushion that's being sold online. Um, so it kind of linked in. And that creative side, I absolutely loved. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the, I suppose walking into my first shop and actually saying to a shop owner, hello, I've just written a book and would you like to stock it, please? I think I walked around the block twice, plucking up the courage to go in. Um, <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't fun. Um, but I have met some fabulous people. One lady who had a gift shop that didn't particularly specialise in books. Um, she said, "I'm very willing to take some of your books." She said because I just love the owl on the front. And um, she said, oh, how much are you charging and what's the commission, etc." And that lady has actually taken books from me and paid me for them directly. Other people have said, we've never heard of you. And I said, well, probably not because it's my first book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, they've kind of said, well, if you want to leave them sale or return, we'll, we'll kind of do our best, you know. And yeah. I thought, well... I've got to sort of come to the, the understanding that not everybody's going to be excited about my book. Not everybody's excited about art like I am. Right. And so being me, I thought, how do I manage this? Because I bought books. I've got a, a stack of them here. In it. Well, you can't see them, but I've got a massive stack of books next to me in plastic boxes. And I thought, that's fine. But if I give them sale or return, what's the best way to do that? So I've actually been putting them in little little sort of cellophane bags. Oh, yeah. So I've got some some small shops that have taken maybe 10 books from me. And I've given them one sample book that people can look through. Right. And all the other books that I've been selling, if I can just be a big crunch, excuse me a minute. Oh, yep. <laughs> Boxes of books everywhere. <laughs> Is a mini box. This is my box for carrying in my car boot. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got nice books that are sort of in, in these little cellophane packs. Yeah. So if the shops actually don't manage to sell them, I get them back and they're still in pristine condition because they're yes. in the plastic. <laughs> yes, and they're not all crumpled. Your corners yeah. don't end up all dinged and dented yeah. and, and fingerprints or smudge marks inside the pages. Yeah. So, so I, I had to have a bit of a think around that. Um, I have got the book on sale on Amazon as well, but that's slightly mm -hmm. separate because they deal with that. I don't have anything to do with that really. Right. right. Um, and I've also had the, I suppose, the luck that I'm not just looking at bookshops, I'm also looking at art galleries that have small small shops attached to them. Mm -hmm. So I've been approaching those and um, I've got three art galleries now that have actually got my book in their shops. So that's been quite exciting. But I think the writing was super fun because it's just my enthusiasm for art <laughs> yeah um, the publishing and the well messing about with word wrap and and that was technically challenging mm -hmm. but I thought yeah I'm gonna crack this if it kills me and I was up till <laughs> three o'clock in the morning quite often because once I kind of got on a roll I just had to keep going yes but the actual um marketing I have struggled a little because until I started getting some good reviews back, I wasn't certain that people were reading my book and getting the same message that I had intended that they should yes. get from reading it. Understandable. Um, and interesting, interestingly enough, uh, a gal that I just interviewed, that was something that, that was brought up was the fact of um, how do I know if somebody has read my book or if anybody has written my written, or excuse me, if anybody has read my book if nobody tells me that they like it, dislike it, if they saw it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, to me, it has really put into my mind that when I read a book that 
especially somebody who is not a well-known author to let them know I read your book yeah your book I thought your book was okay you know whatever my reaction is and and truly I wouldn't just say your book was okay (laughs) (laughs) I would you know I would point out what I really liked of the book because yeah every book has value you know somewhere there's there's value in every book and And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I really need to do that with the the books, you know, for the authors that I have read their books. Well, normally I travel and see part of why I was really curious about your your narrow boat. And then again, you sent to me the picture of it um, in the email. And so that really drew my curiosity about the narrow boat, because (laughs) Uh, four years ago, I sold my home, sold most of my possessions, I bought a truck and a camper. And I have lived, for a lack of a better word, the remote lifestyle or nomadic lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And normally, in the winter months, I'm traveling. And this year, I'm not. Uh, There are things that have kept me here in my home state. And, and, um, and I need to tend to those things. So so when I saw the the narrow boat, the picture, it was like, okay, so is this some place that she vacations on? Is this some is this you know a boat that she spends an afternoon on, or is this where she's living? <laughs> oh no, we, we couldn't. We couldn't. <laughs> the lo- the longest we normally would go go on our boat would be about seven or eight days. Okay. Um, yeah, you you can just about manage that. It's very compact because. The, the seating at the front of the boat becomes the bed in the night. So you've got okay. to kind of convert it and you could leave it there, but I like it neat and tidy. Mm-hmm. And because we've got so many, um, we, we had all the, the artwork on it. And we've also got these two rag dolls called Rosie and Jim. And years ago, when I was a child, there was a program on the BBC television for children, which was all about Rosie and Jim who lived on a canal boat. And when the canal boat owner used to get off the boat and go and do whatever, these ragdolls came to life and had their little exciting stories. Oh, <laughs> and fun. a lot of people of, of sort of my age all recognise Rosie and Jim. And we managed to get the original ragdolls that were probably like about this tall. Okay. Um, but, but we managed to get hold of them. So we used to have those sat on the seats, on our seats at the front of the boat. And a lot of people would come along then, tourists and holiday makers, and say, oh, Rosie and Jim, oh, can we get a photograph? So, <laughs> oh, so it. it wouldn't have been too good if we had a photograph with the doors open and the bed still made up. So <laughs> we used to have to pack the bed away every night. <laughs> oh, that's great, uh, though. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it was a good holiday. And just getting back a second when we were saying about um, knowing whether people have liked the book or not. I don't know if you can catch this close up, but you'll see my owl is on my phone and it says time to start your art. See the owl there? Yes. yes. Right. Well, what I've done, I've set up a Facebook group that's a private group for people who've purchased my book and started painting to actually put their paintings on the Facebook group. Brilliant. I've, I've got some ladies now. One lady put a beautiful review. She she hadn't painted for about 50 years because she got the lowest grade possible in school and thought she was absolutely hopeless at art. Mm-hmm. And then she read my book and she thought, yeah, I'll give it a go. And she's now actually a member of my Facebook page and, and putting her art on there. And all the people that are on the group I've got, 21 people at the moment and I'm not looking to get a thousand because I want it to be comfortably sized with people that are like-minded and and are there to just sort of support one another and help each other Mm -hmm. so that's been that's been probably the the biggest excitement now is the fact that people have started reading my book and I know some people have actually gone out bought paint one lady contacted me before Christmas and she said, Father Christmas, in other words, my husband, has no knowledge of artwork, 
could you point him in the right direction, please? And I gave her a whole list of um, ideas of things that, that she should buy in terms of paints and papers and stuff. How wonderful. So this, is, this is the kind of the exciting bit again now for me that, that I've got people that are now as passionate as I am about art, actually, or because mm -hmm. I've written my book. <laughs> so that's really good. Yes. Agreed. So out of curiosity, and I just looked at what time it is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 please do not apologize because I could easily sit here for a couple of hours with you. Not a problem. <laughs> well, I, I don't. Oh, I've got 24 members. I've just noticed. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> another one. <laughs> that is wonderful. See, before we get going, though, I want to make sure and before I forget, one, <laughs> where can people find out about you? What is your website? It's just called suetressler.com. Okay, perfect. And That's I will it. have a link to it on the show notes page. Not a problem. And then if, if there was any bit of advice that you would give to somebody I'll let you choose if it's a writer or an artist, because it's kind of interchangeable. But for somebody getting started, what is a bit of advice that you would share to them? I think the biggest bit of advice is don't let yourself get overwhelmed by everything that's out there and everybody that's out there. Because so yes. many people will be very helpful but somebody will come at you from one side and say, you never stretch paper. Somebody will come from the other side and say, you've got to stretch paper or you can't possibly paint on it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with writing because somebody will come and say, you can't possibly just sit down and write a book. You have to plan it. And somebody else will say, just write what comes out of you and, and it will just happen. And there's no right or wrong way for anything you do in life. Yes. And I think the main thing is to have confidence in the way you feel you want to do it and just go for it. Yes. Yes. Agreed. There is no right or wrong. It's just expression. Yep. <laughs> it's just perception. So, yeah, just go for it. Yes. Oh, well, Sue, I have truly, truly enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> uh, you know, you're a woman after my own heart, you, you know, the, the creative mind <laughs> and spreadsheets. I found somebody who uses spreadsheets like I use spreadsheets all the time. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just I'm just so relieved that we've managed to do this because after our, our earlier attempts with technology not quite working, I thought, oh, I, I got really excited about this. And then I, I thought, me oh, too. Dear, what do I do? <laughs> Well, like I said in the beginning, you know, or well, I guess it was towards more towards the middle of the, the conversation that when when I saw that dandelion on on your website, it, it you could have written complete gibberish on that podcast application you were in. It didn't matter. I wanted to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> well, because I, I tell you what. I've also had that dandelion made into cards, little cards oh, for notes, because um, when I when I had my book that people purchased from my website, mm -hmm. um, that's only in the UK, mind you, because right. I, I haven't got the phone postage on that. I, I'll do it if people will pay postage. <laughs> um, people that purchased off my website, uh, they they all had for the first hundred a hand-painted card that said thank you so much for purchasing my book <laughs> oh what a wonderful idea that's a great marketing idea <laughs> you know and also you know all those testimonials that you're getting on you know on your Facebook group you know sharing those words yeah you know Mary you know shared and then then the testimonial how would she yeah. out of the book <laughs> And those are, you know, putting those on your website, putting those on your personal uh, profile for, you know, whatever social media that you use. And of course, then the, the uh, ones that you're using for um, your, well, for your book. Um, mm -hmm. 
that will carry so much weight out there and really help to entice others. But yeah. again, that title is just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that, it truly really is because it was just like, I like that book title. And then I went to your <laughs> website and I'm like, oh, yep, she's in. <laughs> she is got to be oh, on the podcast. Yeah. So, so you mean all, all my best writing to sort of say why I needed to be in and why you'd want me. I didn't <laughs> bother with that. I had to just put the art in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yes, it does have something, you know, yes, I do look at it. And yes, I, I, yeah. I do. No, but... <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I am very, very grateful. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you because it's like a soulmate because you, you sort of you're with me and the spreadsheet bit is fabulous because not everybody's into spreadsheets. <laughs> I believe at this point, Sue and I had already said goodbye several times. However, we continue to talk and here are some random clips of our follow-up conversation with insights that I felt would be fun to share and also wise information. Enjoy! Mine, I did, I did go absolutely over the top, and this is in my book, to recommend to people not to sort of get too hung up on paint, because when I first went into watercolour, there was all the whether it was opaque, um, whether it was sort of um, got a hot colour, a cool colour and all sorts of different things. And in the end, I thought I can't cope with all these fancy names and yes. what they are and everything. And I started to convert it into a spreadsheet. Then I realised that whether you've got sort of Winsor Newton or um, Daniel Smith and all the different types of paint, they got different names for the same colours. Yes. And, yes. Um, and in the end, I just lost myself. And I'd spent ages and I thought, I've wasted all this time and I could be just painting. And does it matter what the paint's called or what it does? I just need to use it and paint. Yeah. So we'll see. I did abandon that spreadsheet. <laughs> the, I have a basket that I use underneath um, to hold my laptop up when I'm doing podcasts I was um, going to show you a few things that I've done because I'm with you I don't whoops let's see if I can get it so it shows up um there no, we I'm, go. I'm, oh that's it yeah oh yeah trees trees yeah. reflecting in the in, in the, the water, water. and yeah. then I don't follow whoops I don't follow no, the warm cool no I just whatever comes out of the paintbrush got it somewhere oh yes this camel it won't notice so much but there's something called a cauliflower if you have slightly dampened paper that's partly dried and you then put watercolor onto it and then you put more watercolor it sort of all bleeds out in a funny cauliflower yeah and she got a cauliflower it won't show to you but on this um camel that she was doing oh I mean, yeah instead of um Instead of sort of panicking about it, the teacher said, put a few more cauliflowers and it will look as if that was the style. Yes. And then but that was we, the intention. And when we were driving home from this watercolour weekend, I, I don't know if you know something called the Seven Bridge, which connects England with Wales in Britain. Okay. And this bridge, we were coming up towards it and it had a beautiful sunset. And this is the photograph of the sunset oh, beautiful and it was so beautiful when I got home I said I'm going to paint that sunset so that was the oops can't see now that's the painting of the sunset beautiful and the idea is people can see in the book then that you can take a picture and you can make it into painting and add a bit more color yes yes so um that, that's why I've got the, the wobbly to wonderful. <laughs> I, you know, yes, because again, perfection is perception. And, you know, it doesn't have to be an exact replica. No, it and, doesn't. Yeah. 
it's our imagination can tinker with it all it wants. Mm -hmm. We are no, given and that ability. My, um, <laughs> that's the ET finger. There's something drastically wrong with that finger. <laughs> <laughs> I see the extra. <laughs> that extra knuckle. Yes. But hey, you know, look at what the stories you've been able to tell because well, a, you added an extra knuckle. <laughs> yeah, I know. But but you see, most of the art books, I've got loads of art books and they've got beautiful illustrations, but they're too nice because none of them have got the wobbly bit. And yes. even, if they've got, even if they've got bits that are showing you how to do something, it's all precision drawn. And yes. if I'm honest now, not that I'm brilliant, but I couldn't draw things the way they're drawn in my book now, because now I know how to draw a jam jar. I couldn't draw it in the wobbly way that I did the first time. Right. Because you, you can't, if, if you've, um, you know, if you've learned to sort of do anything really, you can't go back and unlearn it and make it look as if you're just starting to do it, can you? Right. It, it's almost impossible. So that's why I wanted the real wobbly bits in the book. <laughs> wow. And guess where that got me? Did it get you first place? It did. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that is so <laughs> wonderful. I love that painting in the pink. Oh, that pink is beautiful. Um, that, is, that is one of the stories in my book to encourage people, you see. Yes. Because it, it took me... Well, I had sort of from the August till the Christmas, the following Christmas. So it took me about two and a half years to get to that first prize. But um, <laughs> I, I did it because I, I thought about it and I didn't get despondent yeah. because I just kept thinking, what can I do better? How can I improve it? Yeah. How can I take um, myself a step further? Yeah. And I think that's what it's all about, stretching your mind. And, you know, I, I really don't mind if people say, oh, I don't like that. Or what on earth have you got that colour for? Or don't think that goes. Because it makes me step back and look at it then and thinking, well, you know, what could I have done a bit different maybe? Or, mm -hmm. or where can I improve? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just mad. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> Who wants to be normal? <laughs> normal oh, is overrated. Normal's not good. I'm just delving. Hang on, sorry. Oh. But um, the trouble is, I've, I've got paintings everywhere now because I just keep painting. Me too. Me too. Oh, I have a whole wonderful. basket of paintings. And it, it's wonderful. It is. But you know what you need to do then with your paintings? I'm sure somebody must do it in America. Over here, we've got um, a city hospice that looks after people that are sort of on mm -hmm. palliative care, mm -hmm. et cetera. And to raise money each year, they have a charity auction and they've done it for about five years. And last year, I plucked up the courage to put one of my paintings into the charity auction because I thought, well, you know, it would be lovely if it made some money and yes. it actually sold. And that, that story's in my book as well. Um, so this year just got, well, November, just before Christmas, they had the, the annual event. Mm -hmm. And I put two paintings in and um, they got £165 for the two paintings in the auction. And that's gone to the, gone to the charity. And um, I just think it's great if your painting can do something like that, you know? Then why not? That's a great then, idea. Um, All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Take care, Lovely Sue. to meet you. Good great to meet to you meet as you. well. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. <laughs> Before we end our time together, I'd like to say thank you for listening to my conversation with Sue Trussler. To access her website and purchase the book she has written, visit pen to paper .com backslash podcasts and select the show notes page for this episode. What is the one takeaway you received from this conversation? Share with us on the show notes page what creative medium is your favorite? Is it painting, ceramics, 
maybe fusing glass or writing. What is it that gets your creative juices flowing? And out of curiosity, does the phrase perfection is perception motivate you to be less critical of your artwork? To receive future episodes in your inbox, such as this episode, subscribe to the newsletter and follow this podcast on your favorite application. You are invited to share your favorite episodes with individuals who will resonate with the content. Take care and until next time, keep your pen to paper and write. Your words have power. Your story matters. Bye for now.